good afternoon thank you so much for uh, joining us today um this is our 12th uh, webinar by uh, tai dubai team uh, since the lockdown uh, tai dubai as you are aware has been uh, fostering entrepreneurship and supporting startups for over 15 years in the region and uh, as part of uh, uh, this journey especially in these unprecedented times when uh, Uh, all of us are learning new technologies embracing embracing change uh, and and really trying to figure out and navigate uh, what the new normal is all about it has been our endeavor to support you in this journey by bringing you panels like this one today by uh, hosting online workshops uh, by doing one on one wellness sessions and we have quite a few of them uh, lined up uh, as we go along um as part of our uh, you know uh, navigating uh, these uh, interesting times i think one of the things that uh, uh, we have all been trying to figure out is uh, how will the world uh, look what is the future what is the new normal uh, and and one element that definitely is is uh, coming under question is uh, the future of money uh, as a banker myself uh, uh, for over uh, 20 years i don't think i have an answer for that we speak to peer bankers the situation is similarly the same but then the best thing to learn about something is to have a conversation and get a better understanding um and what most central banks bankers and everybody have been trying to do is get rid of cash from the system and if there is one single event which has provided an impetus to people not even wanting to touch physical cash is this situation i mean be it uh, the teller in the bank or my wife who doesn't want to take cash from the delivery boys i think we are all in the same stage where in you know what we don't want to touch the cash um but again that is just an anecdotal element that is not going to you know uh, give us a view of how the future is going to be and who can probably help us understand that better is this panel that we have put together a fantastic panel of some really really distinguished guests uh who will provide their expertise to us today and and leading and moderating this panel for us today will be uh our fellow charter member gaurav dar uh gaurav as you may all know is our is a ceo of uh, marshall equipment he is also a board member of the meena fintech association um and and very simply put and i any i don't think i'll be able to do proper justice to his, his credentials but i think uh, i would very simply say that when it comes to fintech in the region when it comes to uh, the future of payment systems i think he is definitely doing a stellar job in leading the way so without any further ado i'll hand it over to you gaurav uh, to to take us through the panel today thanks so much vivek for that uh, for that introduction can you hear me okay is that clear great so i think what i want to do is 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 in taking over from the from vivek in the conversation i'd like to lay out the map for today's conversation the first thing i'm going to do is is introduce the topic very briefly and then i'm going to introduce my panelists what we're going to do is we're going to go through each panelist providing their perspectives and insights because they're in all parts of the world and it's a very 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 exciting panel we want to make this as interesting as possible for all of you who have joined us today Uh, I think we're at about 80 participants at the moment and more coming on board. So thank you for your time and thanks to all the participants. So with that let me set the tone for the conversation. You know, will cash become redundant? Cash becoming redundant as Vivek said is a conversation that's not new. But with the advent of COVID and the onset of COVID in all ecosystems, it's changed the baseline for the conversation for everyone. Whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're operating on a daily business or your a business small or large and with that having said that everyone's been trying to fight the use of cash when it comes to digitization initiatives from entrepreneurs to individuals to business to operators and that has had its own momentum in each ecosystem geographically with different inertia india has had its moments asia has had its moments the united states moves at its own threshold and own pace and and you know there's we've managed to cover that entire geography on this panel so what i'd like to do is is i'd like to introduce that panel to all of you 
First of all, today we have Mr. Kanchan Kumar. Kanchan, thank you for joining us. He's the co-founder and CEO of Remitter. Remitter is democratizing, as they say, international banking for small businesses with the goal of making it simple and cost-effective to do business globally. Their proprietary payment network covers 75 countries today, making it possible to pay and get paid in 40 currencies within a day. Kanchan, thanks again for your time. We look forward to your contribution today. Our next panelist is Mr. Prashant Gulati, better known as PK. A lot of you know PK and a lot of you don't know PK, but at one point or another, you will know PK. PK has been part of the largest support network for entrepreneurs globally with Thai as a founder and now president emeritus. He's been working with startups in Dubai, India, the United States. He's been an angel investor and he's also a venture capitalist. He's the founder of the Smart Start Fund. He's been working with seniors from Google and WhatsApp behind that. He's also an advisor to the DFF, the Buy Found Future Foundation, and Hub71. I could go on and on about PK, and he will obviously uh, give a lot of input and insight to us today on this topic. Thank you, PK, for joining us. Our next panelist is Mr. Sitse Kulin. Sitse, over the last 15 years, has been a business operator in various fintech and payment startups as well as being an operating partner at Arbor Ventures. This gave him a look and an insight into startups, both from an operational side, as well as an investor side, something I speak to personally very closely, and, and Sitz and I know each other very well in that space. The past eight years, he's lived and worked in Stockholm, the United States, the Middle East, Europe, and Asia, including Tokyo and Singapore. Thank you, Sitz, for joining us. Last but not least, we have Puneet, Puneet Thakur. Puneet is, has a very, very unique viewpoint on the ecosystem. He has 10 years of experience in the industry, in payment processing, APMs, closed loop ecosystems, ecosystem, sorry. and he's built platforms and technology sets from scratch. He's worked with acquiring banks, everyone. So Puneet, thank you again. We look forward to your insights today. With that, I'd like to start off with a geographical overview, uh, Sitse. I'd like to put you in the driver's seat for opening up the conversation. With your perspective, looking at Asia, Europe, startups, you have a, a very interesting insight of how cash was becoming redundant in those ecosystems. Sweden sure. is almost a zero cash economy. QR payments in Asia has taken the, you know, that part of the world by storm. Uh, there's an e-commerce company cropping up every day. You probably get 50 people contacting you saying, invest in my business, it fights cash. I'd like to understand the conversation as it was moving, was moving at pace in those ecosystems. Has something changed today? Is cash going to become redundant? Uh, what are you seeing in where you are in what your part of the world? Well, I, th I think it's a, it's a twofold question. I think we're, the, the answer if cash is going to be redundant today, I think that's sort of pretty much a full no, because you know, to always stay there somewhere lingering in the background. But, you know, will cash decrease? Yes. Uh, it, it is decreasing right now, and, and COVID is a big driver. Uh, however, if you look at this discussion, it's been going on for 10, 15 years. Uh, you see in even most developed countries, like in Europe, there's still a 50% cash usage. usage. Uh, places like Japan, even more so. And then, uh, yeah, having lived in the U.S. and also in uh, Singapore, that's that's the places where I see cash uh, rapidly decreasing and and, and cards and, and and such popping up. I think at least just to share sort of one my, one of my ideas is that it's very hard to eradicate cash because it's a very cheap way of moving money from one person to the next person. There's nobody in between as such. It's the government who is in between. And and when you want to convert cash into digital, then there's certainly so some sort of cost involved. And unless you can sort of completely get that cost to zero, but that means somebody else has to pay for that sort of, you know, logistical service, uh, you know, then it becomes easier to get cash out of the system. And I think one of the recent developments I've seen in, from a FinTech and from an investor in, and, and also from a startup perspective is, you know, the companies that are basically digitizing payroll and getting payroll onto a card or getting payroll onto a platform or anything like that, because that's where it originates. And then when you take it at, at sort of as a 
origination point from where the, the money is made and then digitize it from there, then it becomes a lot easier than digitizing it halfway in the stream where somebody has to go to a convenience store, 7-Eleven, Konbini, Japan, and then drop the cash and then pay for digital service. So I think that's just sort of, you know, I think an, an insight that I want to share that I've seen across multiple of these jurisdictions and disciplines. So what are you, what are you seeing in terms of, you know, the cost of cash, the ecosystem and the rails? How progressive are these economies? Are they faster, moving even faster towards cash becoming less of a usage? Are we talking about 5%, 10%? What's the, what's the movement happening towards that? Like you said, cash will never become redundant from your viewpoint, but how much is it becoming... Deeper. Over the last years, it's been it's been going very slow. We're not talking five percent or something per year. We're we're talking dropping just one two percent per year over a longer period of time, and and even that would be on the high side because you know over ten ten year period it hasn't dropped twenty percent. I mean, it's barely dropped like ten fifteen percent in many of these countries, and um, you know, and then it's sort of slowing down as well because I think you'll always see some of these funds needed for wet markets you know if you want to get your bad juice or your bad wings in china you have to get some cash with you uh, but you know you, you definitely need cash and and people want to stay anonymous so unless there's an alternative for that you know uh, you know you, you'll, you'll you'll keep seeing cash i think governments uh, are are a very important part play a very important role in that and and um, yeah, we were talking about it, I think, earlier in another conversation is that if you have a government who's pro um, demonetization, then that helps. But then on the same side, governments will also want to keep their sort of, you know, lower uh, income um, uh, workforce uh, not being, being stripped from, from payment methods by, by enforcing that they have to pay with cards or anything like that. So I think I think that's. Uh, you know, the combination of legislation and as well of governmental push uh, could help. But at the same time, I don't know. I mean, uh, for me, it's, it's really uh, it's a slow process that's, that sort of will go on for the next 10, 15, 100 years, perhaps. I think, I think that, that neatly segues into, into our next panelist, uh, TK. Uh, thanks, TK. I think TK, from, if, if anyone on this panel can give an insight from a global perspective, from the macro viewpoint of technology and legislation, I think you have a very good foothold on this. And, and you know, in, in your capacity, I'd love for you to share with us, uh, leading on from what Tite was talking about, is you know the demonetization, people legislation. There's always this conversation that someone wants to solve the problem of cash or you know fighting cash. Um, is, is it so much about technology or is it, what else is there from, you know, like CITES saying government legislation, what are you seeing as the trends and is it repeating itself or is it an isolation? Is India doing what India is doing? Is the Middle East doing what the Middle East is doing? What are you seeing from your perspective on, on cash and those unit economics? Gaurav, thank you very much uh, for having us over. The first thing that I would tell you is it's not because of technology. It's not, technology is not a limiter, it is a solved problem. Moving uh, money across borders, across from people to people, uh, doing it seamlessly, doing it quickly, doing it instantly, across currencies, across this, is a solved problem. It's not something that where we are looking for a solution to a problem. It isn't. I think the bigger uh, restrictions are actually more man-made in the sense in terms of regulation, in terms of restrictions. Some of them may be considered very valid restrictions. Some of them may be considered not so valid restrictions. So I think the, the restriction is more on not, the innovation is restricted more, in my opinion, by, uh, you know, uh, you know the, the, the lack of will at times than anything else. Now, we have examples today of um, you know things which have happened in the world which have actually given a fillip to this um, you know um, you know a small earthquake came in India in the form of demonetization uh, a few years ago and overnight uh, majority of the cash in the country was unusable it became useless tender what did that do 
that pushed India very far into digital money. You know, you, you can see pictures of people selling bananas on the side of the road with a QR code to actually pay across. So that was, that was, that was a very substantial move that happened. Now, it was intended, it was not intended, you know, we don't know that yet, but the unintended actually consequence of that probably was that a very large portion, a few hundred million people suddenly became digitally active, became digitally capable of doing financial transactions, almost everything that they do uh, uh, on the digital rails. Um, COVID has done, in my opinion, that earthquake on a global level, where suddenly you have restrictions which are enforced by uh, restriction of movement. So now it is not possible to, for example, do certain things like with cash, even if you wanted to do them with cash. There are a lot of things, restrictions which in which the change exchange of money can't take place because of legal reasons, like there's enforcement in Saudi, for example, of cashless transactions. If you do any delivery at home, for example, those kind of restrictions are already happening. And then people are not that comfortable actually exchanging cash. So when you look at that, those are the, those are the, the, the things that give an impetus to these kind of movements of these changes that come across. So I think that is one. So globally, there is some movement that's happening. Now, the bigger question for me, uh, which I would say is how progressive are the regulators and the government to actually let this happen and let this happen at scale and let this happen uh, transparently without cost. Now, you know, all these things that we've talked about have a substantial plethora of uh, middlemen. You know, people who grab a piece of the action when things move, and it's probably in their interest to keep these restrictions on. It's in their interest to keep that on. So there could be two diverse ways that we could go from this point in COVID. One could be the enlightened way where we see, you know what, this, these are rails, these need to be you know, uncosted or in the sense at like very low cost and uh, allow everybody to build on top of it. The other reaction could be completely the opposite where the middlemen or the people, vested interests, banks, they get far more power and they actually reduce and postpone this move towards an open uh, society. So I don't know where it is and I think different countries and different parts of the world will actually behave differently. So you will see some of them will completely go digital, completely go cashless and, you know, go the China way. Um, uh, you know, the other day we were discussing uh, why China is able to show off like a hundred unicorns, which have 200, 300, 400, 500 million users uh, of each from e-commerce to, uh, you know, physical movement of goods, selling stuff. And you realize one of the biggest reasons is these two major things that they did very well. And they were done by private companies, by the way. One is payments. So WeChat or Alipay, if you look one of those, those are like rails which are available to anybody as APIs and their costs are five basis points, which is like, it doesn't even have an incentive to build a competing one. And it's available by a private company to anybody. And the second thing was delivery in which anybody could actually plug into an API where somebody will come pick up the package and deliver it to a second place. So if you look at from that point, those kind of things actually multiplied the success stories. So maybe we should do things like that. So I think globally, lots of ideas, lots of directions that you'll see. So very, very interesting, PK. Thank you for those, those insights. It, it sounds to me like there's going to be scenarios in which governments are going to lead the way and there are going to be ways, there's going to be scenarios in which the private sector is going to bulldoze its, its sort of way through in, in providing those, those rail ecosystems. Who knows, perhaps in, in the time of COVID, you might even find a quasi-government private sector relationship being born in certain segments to appease those middlemen, perhaps who are you know, forming uh, gateways or blocking the rails from forming as, as part of a sort of a, how would you say, a, a compromise of equals to, to not, you know, um, impede on progress. Because I think the one thing that we all do, all of us here on this panel, perhaps the people who have come on board and, and looking at the polls people have answered, people are in favor of, of digitization where possible. 
you know, and in, in digital interactions when it comes to, to transactions. Um, and, you know, taking forward from there, uh, Kanjan, I'd like to engage you for, for, for taking it on from where PK has left off. Um, you know, the North America operates on its own mandate. It, 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 it's sort of, you know, you know, when chip and pin as transactions came out, North America said, listen, we're okay. We'll, we'll, we'll take on technology when we feel like taking on technology. And that's only one instance, right? So, so, so North America is, is a completely different ecosystem. And at the same time, a huge, huge ambassador and advent of, of venture capital startups, you know, uh, stoking the, 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 the flames of, you know, trying to work with people, whether it's Blade or it's Venmo or, it's, you know, you get you know, all sorts of companies, Square, the rest of it giving birth to all these monsters, right? Uh, from your perspective, where you sit, right, dealing with businesses, right? We've, we've looked at legislation, we've looked at rails, we've looked at ecosystem. I'd, I'd like to try and narrow it down a little bit more to, to the business perspective and, and the North America block in your perspective. What's going on there? I mean, you're growing at, an, at, at, a, at a rate which sort of suggests, yes, technology is happening. But what are those ecosystems doing as well? So if you can elaborate on those points, I'd, I'd love that share with us what you guys are looking at for the next uh, two, three years in the North America block. Great. Um, thank you, Gaurav, for having me here. Um, two things which is uh, very apparent here. One, uh, from a consumer side, there is a push to avoid cash transaction. And from a merchant side, at least at this moment, um, there is a um, need to avoid transaction. The reason why I said need is because it's not something which merchants in North America, um, and again, you know, I'll categorize two, cat two different uh, types of merchants, larger stores, smaller merchants. Smaller merchants have been wary of um, card acceptance or a digital payment methods. And the reason for that is very simple. Small merchants, for them, cash flow is important. Cash is something which is immediately usable at zero cost, right? Any other method puts a pressure on them to one, delayed money coming into their bank account, which basically means that you cannot, what you could have bought today in terms of supplies, you can only buy tomorrow or day after because typically T plus two settlements, right? Um, and second is there's a cost associated and that cost has not been transparent over a period of time, depending upon what card is being accepted, you would not really know whether you are paying 50 cents for this transaction or you know, 3% for this transaction. You have no way to know that, right? Newer um, card acquirers have really come up with solutions of saying, hey, here is one blended margin. At least you know you're going to be paying 2.9% flat, right? So there's a, a regulatory aspect as, as well which comes here. So unless, so if you look at it today, there has been a movement away from cash. People, when they go to corner store, they avoid using cash. Merchants avoid using, uh, asking for cash. They have even merchants who had, um, you know, the car terminals have brought it out, which they would not have brought it out earlier unless you said, oh, I don't have cash, right? Because they preferred cash. They have brought the cash, uh, the car terminal out. Will they continue using their car terminal? will depend a lot on whether we take this as a uh, moment to make those changes happen. Can we make it easier for them to get money back into their hands uh, quickly enough at a lower cost if we, and at a transparent cost, not anything which varies between fixed 50 cents to 3%, which you don't know how much is going to cost. Unless we do that, the motivation will not be there. It's a need right now the motivation to switch permanently will not happen. What would happen is as things progress, and if you have not made any efforts towards this end, they would go back to accepting cash. Oh, there is a um, you know, vaccine here and I'm safe or I feel safe. 
let me accept cash. And as anecdotally, you would have seen people spraying disinfectant on cash and they would do, continue doing all of that. However, the good part is that I see a lot of innovation happening in this space and not just from startups, but also from um, the push from uh, the card networks. I'll give you the example of Canada. Uh, Canada has been an early adopter of not just spin and chip, but uh, NFC payments, right? Um, Canada, 100% of payment, 100% of places you can actually go and tap your card and pay. The limit used to be $100. Now, uh, both, I mean, almost all acquirers have made it up to $200. And now they made it flexible that if a merchant says I can accept up to 250, they will enable up to $250 uh, for payments. And that is massive. So if you look at it, that was the impetus which COVID made that happen. Is it going to go back to 100? No, it's not going to go back to $100. It's going to remain uh, 200, 250, which means that you don't need pin and chip for up to 200 or $250 uh, transactions. You can just tap your card and use it. If you look at south of the border in um, US, none of that has really happened. But what really has happened is there's a lot of push from um, you know, the ISOs to go back to their merchant and tell them that, hey, this is an opportunity. Here is a deal which I cut out. I'm going to give you a discount because they see this as an activation exercise that you always had a customer who was not really ready for you can I activate it by giving some, uh, you know, freebies, whatever else. And that is something which is starting to happen. That is more, uh, you know, uh, not really something which is synchronized. It's not something which is very planned. It's more on an individual level in small pockets. But depending upon how long the situation stays, I see that becoming a movement and making digital payments a merchant friendly because till the time digital payments become merchant friend friendly as friendly as cash or as close to becoming as cash this is not going to be a long-term trend interesting thanks for that perspective it really it really puts things into play about the function of cash versus the function of technology in giving access to the same features or accessibility cash has as a value proposition for people to interact on a daily basis or to interact with their business from a supplier or a merchant, right? I think that's, that really puts things into perspective for use case when it comes to, to businesses, how quickly they have access to the same functionality that cash in hand has. And it's the same for the consumer, I imagine, as well, right? Uh, consumer choice to adopt uh, the interactions that they make on a daily basis with cash or digital would have the same, the same effect, right? not only for output, but also input, as they talked about earlier, right? And developing those rails and the cost of those rails for, for cashing out and cashing in and, and, and building those ecosystems. Uh, so thank you for that insight, Kanchan. Uh, Puneet, last but not least, for, from a perspective point of view, you sit across a number of countries. Uh, and, and again, looking at this MENA focus, right? Especially, if, and correct me if I'm wrong, with the MENA focused company, you are seeing volume of transactions, you're seeing types of transactions. As an enabler, uh, you must be overwhelmed right now with people trying to hurry to build on top of your rails, associate with your rails, you know, to go out as businesses as, as things change, going on what Tsitsa and PK and Kanshan were talking about, to have that accessibility of, of, of that service. But is that actually the fact? Are you seeing that there's a, there's a desperation for people coming to you? And are you seeing any changes in those trends? So, so two parts of a question to you. Mm -hmm. What's different around the MENA region? What are yeah. you seeing in terms of industry trends? Okay. What's changing? And, and who's coming to you? Maybe there's even a third part saying, you know, we need to now come to you and say, we need to work with you before. And before they weren't really moved because cash was king right, and where those businesses were operated. So yeah. I hope I haven't overloaded your plate, uh, Puneet, but I, I'd love to, to sure. hear your perspective. Okay. So thank you, Gaurav, for uh, this particular question and providing uh, this opportunity. 
So there is a very good and a famous saying, cash is king, but uh, now plastic is the new queen, right? So, so if cash is king and uh, plastic is the new queen, who is the child? That's NFC. And as uh, my friends Kanchan, PK and Sidze said, the new child is born because everyone wants to make everything simple and easy. How you make the entire ecosystem simple and easy? That is the need of an hour. So, so let me take a step back, uh, Gaurav, and probably I can answer your question specifically. But in two minutes, uh, considering the MENA market, uh, it was like an eight-man theory, right? It was like an evolution of mankind, uh, car, uh, the credit card and uh, contactless. So you started with 100% cash, where uh, you know the entire MENA region was loaded with cash. Not even a wallet, but everything was in a pocket. You make the payments. If you have the change, let the merchant or anyone keep the change, right? Then came an evolution where POS was born. Now, the, for the last 10 years, what you've seen is there are new kind of wallet devices. So it's all about connected commerce, right? Where how you can make that cash, cashless, and what are the acceptability? So issuing a card, issuing a wallet is not, not a difficult task, right? What is the acceptance important theory, right? Is how this particular aspect will be accepted. So today, if you sneeze on TikTok, people will like it. Or people will say, oh, I, I really have a fear. But today, if you sneeze for a payment, probably people will love it, right? Because that is innovation. So based on your iris scan or retina, probably you can make a payment. So to answer specifically the question, uh, in this particular industry, uh, in the MENA region, cash is still king. But because of the government and the new other initiatives, you still see that everything has been transferring and there is a huge digital transformation. Now, because of COVID, you see there are a lot of places like two days back, there was a, there was a notice from Saudi where the entire cash will be converted cashless. So all the mom and pop-up stores, all the groceries will not accept cash anymore. They feel cash is not safe. So that's an amazing opportunity. So now when you talk about the industry verticals, uh, what I would, I would like to tell you is there were schools in this MENA region where everything was cash, everything was checked. They have converted to online, as you know, and 50 to 60% of the transactions converted online. People are trying to buy diapers online, which you never expected. People are buying diapers on subscriptions. And you always have to also think of two perspectives. What we also realize from a lot of players coming to us and telling us what is not what we have and what is what we have. So what we realized from that is the segmentation was important. How you can make it simple for a 70-year-old person or a 50-year-old man to buy his medicines online. How you can make that particular person call. So it's a simple SMS where you can actually just click and make a payment, right? So the most important thing is how simple you can make the experience. So as to answer your second question, or probably just an extension of the first question, the layers, what you built on top of this payment platform and infrastructure is important. So when you're talking about a simple in interference of an interoperable model, to make it simple, when you start connecting a wallet, connecting a QR code, as the PK and Sidze and the Kanchan mentioned, plus connecting the credit cards and everything, making it in a simple umbrella, adding all these payment options in a simple aggregator, rather than having different, different commerce. If you start connecting all that commerce, that is where the market trend is going. So let's take an example. Uh, a, a Saudi person or probably uh, an Omani person is stuck in Dubai and he just has an Omani card. He really doesn't want to pay through his Omani card because he has to pay an extra FX. How you can make it simple for them? So where we are talking about a lot of these innovative companies are trying to build an infrastructure which can connect the entire MENA region like the UPI of India. So in simple terms, uh, connected commerce in the entire Middle East and North Africa region for accepting cross-border currency in a simple way is the new thing which will definitely make all the things simple. 
in terms of market trends what we have seen uh, of lately is the guie segments have 80% of transactions online so guie is government utility insurance and education people have started uh, using online tools for education schools have actually changed everything online so there is a transformation they are started sending email invoices and reminders medicines and pharmacies and clinics have gone online now the most important aspect where 80% or even 85% was cash based was bill payments so when you talk about uh, a, an unbanked person he still has to go to a bakala store to buy his recharge for 20 20 dirhams or 50 dirhams how can you make him convert to an online customer that was a need where neo bank neo bank is formed and there are a lot of unbanked guys converting to a bank population so that particular layer is the most important layer which has a new thing which is called as connected commerce so guie is really trending there is a horeca segment which is hospitality retail or hospitality restaurant and catering that horeca segment we have seen 65% roughly growing in the main region and 80% online for bill payments and government and utilities so people are really buying all the sports and fitness online but that's that's not a common need right that is just for the 20% of the the main people so that's more of that and and just to end this uh, for the second question there is a huge need because all the governments and regulators have started changing the perspective of a bank or a payment company or a seller by having an ekyc system we just having a chat about the ekyc uh, today with uh, sidze and uh, pk and we we already discussed that this ekyc building that particular ekyc together globally is is the new thing because everyone wants a simple experience thanks for that punith i think it's it's very interesting to understand those different segments which are reacting and you know your your opening remark saying that cash is king or cash was king in these segments shows that there was clearly a, a large part of that ecosystem which needed or had the appetite to convert it was sitting there in dormant but perhaps in the coming 5 10 15 years with the advent of connected commerce or these ecosystems which aren't trying to operate in silos but operate together as a gcc ekyc platform or a gcc uh, net if you like in those circumstances perhaps it will take you know another 10 or 15 years before we get to the quandary that sits is facing in any easy ecosystem where you know the the rate at which conversion of cash to digital is slowing down because that saturation point is 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 coming through i think i think that's definitely something to consider um i can see oh, pk has got his hand up sorry pk you would like to say something please you know while we are all saying the same thing we all believe cash is going to go down cash needs to go down and all that one of the reasons why this is slowing down or cash has not gone away even despite the fact i remember the day when the major e-commerce players here noon and amazon decided to stop cash on delivery you know there was a big push which happened because of that okay and it was a big risk to do because when your larger uh, segment of your customers actually tries to use cash yeah. you know which was actually very detrimental to 75% yeah but it was also a, a major loss for them because a lot of them would actually get uh, you know buyers remorse and not buy it or just do it for fun because there was no no there was no loss in the sense and refused to accept it for example when they did that but a bigger reason for that actually i believe has always been where people have actually tried to use cash uh is because of the cost of using digital you know this whole layer of like so today whatever we are talking about today in this region at least is built on the credit card debit card the visa master rails when you look at that and when you look at it it is an invisible 2 to 5% if i'm being conservative cost on top in any transaction you know so there are a lot of industries which or a lot of areas which just can't afford that kind of overhead okay wallets don't work because if you use credit cards to fill those wallets you are anyway on a loss so finally at the end of it so you have a free wallet 
actually being you know loaded up with with the, the premium before it actually goes in so cash stays so people are forced to actually use cash because that percentage has gone away and i think that is where a lot of innovation has not happened in fact all the innovation that we're talking about about cards but debit cards in this area in this region this guy doing that that card i'm not naming the companies but you know who i'm talking about all these people are running in spite of the system in fact they're trying to build something by bending the rules going around rather than actually getting a chance to build something which is actually innovative so i think i think looking at that conversation pk before i come to you kanchan in just a second i've seen how uh, stc pay has taken the the bull by the horns as you know one of those people that's really taken the charge to say we're going to go out and pay for an ecosystem and try and get people to to change a habit and, and and move to this digital frontier of interaction and i think they've 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 started with a bang in saudi arabia but i don't think they're going to stop there i believe they have very aggressive plans to go out for their entire uh, stc network across the region so it's going to be very interesting to see puneet the 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 ecosystem changes you say are on their way versus the race of an SCC as a privateer or almost a quasi privateer like we had discussed earlier in the conversation to to work on a rails or extend a rail maybe SCC becomes pay takes on the charge and says we'll offer the rails in a cheaper segment to bring this economy all connected together or not we, we have yet to see kanchan sorry you wanted to say something as well please yeah i wanted to also bring about one particular point about check payments while it's not cash um i'm not sure how many of you are familiar but uh, the part of the world that i live in b2b transactions continue to happen on check payments um it's difficult to believe because large part of developing economy has moved to um you know bank transfers for uh, payment but this part of the world has remained what really has covid really has done is also digitize that so a large part of the volume increase that we see is pure replacement of check payment people because now you cannot go and pick up go to your office and pick up check because usually that will get delivered to your office you can't go to bank and deposit the check because half the branches are closed and the, the timing is curtailed we we see that as changing um, more rapidly and i think that is something which is in a b2b transaction space um the check payment is going away much faster than cash is going in a consumer to merchant transaction space so the digitization of 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 the interaction space necessarily not only just in terms of cash can also be happening on the point of review when it comes to checks i think i think we have a a, a very healthy uh, check habit in the middle east when it comes to payments as well i think i think that at some degree will change but how and when is is yet to be seen i think the basis of the conversation that that puneet brought up with regards to kyc uh, or a universal kyc linking those ecosystems together for the security of digitization of whether it's going to be businesses that used to operate on check or cash or credit or buy now or pay later that you know slowly cropping up into this ecosystem i think that's going to be these are going to be these foundation elements which are which are going to be very interesting to see i think uh, seat say uh, what i'd like to do is, is you know i think you know from from your perspective as well you've been spending a lot of time in this region uh, recently the pre covid uh, you know uh, looking into north africa or africa as a market again it it's segmented very much like the middle east is or the gcc is in in that certain markets are more mature than others in terms of their economics and their digital infrastructure when it comes to financial technology and services what have you seen in africa with key examples like say a kenya or a nigeria or an egypt you know uh in terms of trends for for cash very large ecosystems very large uh you know uh, change you know variables in the economy what are you seeing in in trends over there for for redundancy of cash because last time i went to egypt cash is is huge over there still you know for an example 
Are you seeing anything? Can you shed some insight there? I think I think one one topic we haven't really discussed today is is uh, you know mobile and um, the use of of your identity right and that's directly linked to to buy now pay later solutions. Uh, it's also directly linked to using cash right. So like I touched upon earlier, is you want to perhaps use cash because you want to do certain transactions that somehow you don't want to show up somewhere in. Uh, in a government record or employment or anything like that, or just want to keep things private to yourself. Um, and it's your movements. And there's a whole group of people in the world who just inherently really want to control their privacy. That's why all these privacy laws are here. And uh, you know, these, these lobbies are strong enough for us to now all have to share data, you know, just keep the data in our countries, et cetera, et cetera, right? So it's a very strong movement. And at the same time, you see, especially in, uh, in Africa as well, they, they jumped into the next avenue, which is mobile. And they linked their identity to that mobile phone. And the question now is like, okay, can you put some stored value on that phone, linking that somehow to your identity, and sometimes not when you choose to, and pay for that? And I think that's sort of what's happening right now is that, you see, you know, Ampesa, but also a lot of other initiatives in, in Africa and in the region where, you know, everybody has a phone. Everybody can theoretically pay with that phone, even uh, without internet. Now, you know, there are some, some initiatives there. And uh, now the question, second question is like, what stored value? What, how do you link that to value? And can you, well, with the digital currency, encrypt something on your phone, do that transaction, even offline somewhere, you know, in the middle of the jungle, uh, you, you exchange phones, you use NFC technology, and then you go your separate ways. But that, that transfer has occurred, like a, like a cash transfer, right? Uh, where there's also no need for any digital um, uh, digital connection to a main server. And I think that's that's something that I'm a very very big believer in, and also spent uh, like time in three by now pay later companies globally. Um, identity and, and not necessarily immediately linking that to a payment method, but just tr me trusting Gorov that he will pay me over time, which, you know, is almost the exact opposite as a check. It's like the check is you want to have that thing in your hand and you want to trust that, you know, you can cash it later on. Uh, now it's just me like, okay, I'm going to deliver it to you and I trust that you will pay me. That is, that's how, how the world's now sort of evolving and then, you know, if, if there's a few questions posed already on that and discussions around KYC and EKYC and everything uh, like that. But I, I think that's, that's where the, the world has to sort of work in tandem with the, uh, you know, decreasing of cash. They also have to increase uh, the levels of KYC, the flexibility in, in the types of KYC that they use and the types of payment methods that you can choose, which sort of are mimicking the use of cash. And, and I think that's that's the issue, especially also in, in a lot of African countries, is that people don't want to have the government to see everything that they're doing. I mean, I'm not uh, at, at all in favor of poaching, but poaching, I think, is the greatest example is that, you know, somehow poaching, you know, you're not going to do that with your credit card. You're, you're going to have cash and cash and cash and cash. And then at some point, it's converted somehow in a bank account. But it's layered on multiple layers of other transactions that occurred before that, and like that, there are so many examples that you can think of. Even, even rent is a great example. You don't want to give the rent to, you know, don't want to tell the government that you get rent and you have to pay taxes on the rent income that you get from having a little house that you own. You want to keep all these things off the grid, and I think that's, you know, especially in Africa, especially in places where. You know, governments are a little bit more controlling, uh, you know, the, the, the population and, and not as liberal as perhaps, you know, countries like Holland, uh, you know, you want to you want to keep that out of the uh, out of the system. Very, very. Thanks a lot Cite, for that. That, that, that puts another twist on the on the viewpoint of why cash will actually never become is something I'm going to throw over to, to, to PK. PK, from your point of view, sort of going 
forward from what Zeech just talked about, you know, giving a bit of perspective on, on Africa and digitization and, and cash, right, or, or mobile wallets and how the playing field has changed. Um, digital currencies has been a topic that's sort of been creeping back up a, a little bit more. Um, and, you know, people are talking about, you know, Facebook Libra responding to, you know, um, China's uh, central bank, you know, and people are talking about, you know, because Bitcoin and cryptocurrency in different various shapes, blockchain technology, you know, these, this, this recipe of, uh, you know, technology not being new, being more trusted, you know, filtering out over time of what is going to be the way forward for the new rails to come up using blockchain or, 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 or cryptocurrency in its format. What is your viewpoint on digital currencies? Do you see a place for it now too early perhaps um, in, in, you know, displacing cash in certain uh, scenarios or you think a slow rollout or again, the same, same of what we've been talking about recently. If they're the rails, it'll come through. If someone pushes it through, it'll be there. But you know, with the volume of currency that's traded, it seems like there's a desire, you know, I can, use digital currency, but I, I don't have to be traced. I can have a digital identity that no one can access. So it's sort of this in-between of what Zita is talking about. But what, I'd like to get your viewpoint on that from, from a macro perspective, if you don't mind. So, so uh, you know, um, I was a part of the group which started, uh, was uh, we founded, we were the crazy guys talking about blockchain in 2015 when the, the, so the, the, Dubai, the precursor to the Dubai blockchain strategy you know, that group came up <clears throat> and I was extremely, extremely, you know, enamored by the technology, extremely positive about its, its use. But, but today I think more maturity and you can probably see it better away from, you know, the noise and the buzz. And there's a realization between digital uh, currency and digital version of currency. You know, the difference from a separate, um, you know, the idealistic way of nobody, unlike, like, without any central control, without any central ownership, or a central bank or a central server, you know, you could actually do transactions which can be completely anonymous or don't require, as you said, your identity to be tied to that transaction kind of scenarios um, are, in my opinion, idealistic, at least in the short term. I don't see something of that sort gaining. Uh, major, pre uh, you know, presence or presence which would be of substance in terms of percentage numbers in global uh, digital transactions for a while. And a lot of it, by the way, has to, again, not to do with technology as much. It has to do with regulation, limitation and control, which people don't want to. With all the security based risk, like look at what KYC has become. You know, KYC used to be at the top end of the pyramid where, where a lot of money was moving through accounts. People wanted to know who are they, you need to know much about it. And now it is ever pervasive to the extent that you can't even open a bank account for days, months, you know, just because KYC has become overarching, you know, where people like there's, and because I think the onus of the repercussion in case a co somebody slips through KYC is completely on the bank or the organization that is doing the KYC. So that over uh, emphasis on that and the, like the, re the repercussion is actually far, far bigger than not the size of the infarction was. So if you look at from that, people will always end up going towards the other side from being conservative. And that's why you see people complaining, banks don't open bank accounts. They don't do this, they don't do my transfers, stuff like that. So those things will happen. With, all, with COVID coming in, I think you will see more conservatism. So there will be more, but governments are so-called giving away a lot of incentives. A lot of like today, yesterday, India announced 10% of its GDP as an incentive package. If you look around, UAE has done, Saudi, Japan, just go down it and you'll find trillions of dollars of incentives gone back. The government will want control in return. So you will see that leaving and making it open will be a difficult thing in the sense of it being substantial. Now, it doesn't mean that experiments and things won't happen. They will happen, but they will probably stay on the fringe of regulation. 
they will also say on the fringe of being anything viable in terms of numbers or volume. This is my way. Uh, thank you. Thank you, PK. Um, before we take uh, questions from the participants who are on the session right now, I'd like to first thank all the panelists for your time. Thank you all very much for providing your insights. Please stay on uh, just in case there are some questions directed to you specifically. But really, thank you, thank you all for sharing your insights. And to summarize uh, for everyone who's here, I think it's, it's key that we identify the takeaways. I think one thing that we didn't hone in on but was obvious and in, in danger of being obvious, we are in what is the new norm for technology and we are heading to a new norm for consumption of that technology when it comes to digital interactions for financial products and services. So what's happening today is because of the mobile phone, like Sita points out, you know, being everywhere today, it's not the same conversation like we used to have when it comes to digital interactions, like Puneet talked about, for when it comes to having a card physically in your hands and a point of sale solution at a merchant. You know, Kanshan and PK talking about legislation, networks, KYC, infrastructure has now been taken for granted with the advent of the internet and the mobile phone, and now with 5G, now with blockchain technology, now with availability, the conversation for accessibility is moot. It has become standard. So I think now that the baseline has shifted, it is also important for us to understand the next baseline that has been forced to be shifted with the onset of COVID will be from these government relationships with the private sector, the private sector taking it up on itself to work with the government in circumstances, circumstances to provide these technologies and platforms, which will be the most fundamental base point for anything to be consumed, whether it's an individual or at a business level. So thank you again, all of you for your time and putting that forward. We, I personally enjoyed your participation and your insights. And with that, I'd like to go to some of the questions that we've had uh, coming in today. One of the questions we have is right now, with so many cashless alternatives available, is there a thumb rule to trust the alternatives for a layperson? I think, I think that's, that's a very good question. I think, uh, Seed say from your point of view, you know, seeing mobile happening and, and payments going through, is there a thumb rule to trust the alternatives for a layperson? Uh, well, that's, that's, that's a very hard question. I think, no, I mean, I, I think there's not really a rule. Uh, you know, and a layperson, I mean, okay, what I've, if I would be a layperson, I would, and I would sort of go in the realms of the, the local, you know, legislating authority, which would be sort of a central bank type of thing, which they would have a horrible website. And then, you know, you sort of have to d deep dive and then they finally found there's a registration of that company, which might not be even the same name as the brand name that they're using. And, you know, you can go maybe and look at the app downloads of this thing on this tool called App Annie. And like, okay, I would just go on and on and on with very not layman like things. And it is, it's very hard. Yes, I mean, uh, in, until something is proven, like pay later solutions, just came out of the hype cycle, I think one or two years uh, ago. And we can now all say like, they're here to stay. But before that, people were also like, yeah, how do I know I get my money? How do I know I get my product? Same goes with PayPal. Now everybody trusts PayPal, right? But imagine PayPal 15 years ago. Uh, yeah, nobody really trusts the PayPal. So I think it's a very, very hard one uh, to answer. I think the, 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 the one thing you can say though is, if you are somehow safeguarding yourself against first getting the product and then actually paying, then you're pretty, pretty fine, right? You're, you don't have much risk there. But if you're first depositing and then paying, then you have somewhat of a much larger exposure. So I would say in any case, in any payment method that you use, make sure that you get your product first and then you pay before, you know, dropping some cash in a in a wallet and and that's the that's the very that's the easiest answers i can think of right now that should give you that surety 
Thanks, uh, Sitse. I think the next question I'd like to direct is at Kanchan. Kanchan, I, I know that you actually had set up in this region and then moved across, and, and KYC was a very strong topic of conversation and motivation, right? I'd like you to, to outline the differences in your experiences when it comes to a B2B format for onboarding businesses in this region versus how you're doing it where you are right now. Um, because without that, you can't attribute the, the use of your service, the launch of your service, you, you'll get into an automatic bottleneck, right? So I'd like you to go through that and, and, and outline how fast is, is KYC managed in the ecosystem you're operating in right now and the one you were in previously? What, what's the gap? What's happening? And what are the benefits of both? Um, it's a very good question because uh, most people don't realize that for a digital payment to become reality, EKYC has to become ubiquitous. Uh, otherwise, it just does not work. Uh, because if you're a regulated entity, the first responsibility you have is to identify the customer that you are opening the account for or you're onboarding. Um, I've worked in um, Dubai and one of our biggest reason for not being able to onboard businesses online was because at that point in time, I'm not aware of the regulations today, there was no way that we could, in a regulatory compliant way, collect all the identity documents online and say that I trust this person to be who he is, what they're saying themselves to be. That change, now that's not uniform everywhere. It's not foolproof everywhere. But the difference that we have seen in this part of the world is that the regulators let you decide that as long as you can identify the person or the company from an independent data source, not only from the what the person is providing you, right? you could onboard the customer. The judgment call is on the regulated entity like ourselves to define whether or not to trust and which independent data source to trust about that person. We could go to the credit scoring system and identify the person. We could go to third party databases and identify the system. I could go to some states and provinces which has got their company registry to go and fetch details from that registry and say, yes, I trust this uh, company. So there are various ways and means of cross verifying what the person is saying and that is good enough. The prescriptive method, which was there has changed into more risk-based approach where the risk is on up upon us to say whether I take this person or not. However, in Dubai, it was a very, very hard prescriptive method that you have to physically see the Emirates ID of the person that you are uh, onboarding and you cannot go and verify it from the Emirates ID website, right? You cannot take a picture. So for example, over here today, when a small business onboards, there's a link which goes to their mobile phone. They take a picture of their digital, um, they take a picture of the selfie, they got to make faces, shift their faces, they take a picture of the driver's license. And we go and identify that database with the name of that person, with the picture of that person, with the document which they have given, as well as a company registry which say that this person is the owner, shareholder, or director, uh, or officer of this company, right? That's good enough for me to verify that, yes, this person is the same person. However, we could not do the same thing uh, there because it simply meant that a person had to walk into somewhere to show their ID document and we had a responsibility to match that. Being a digital company, I have no way that I can call a person to come, right? Not in my data center for sure. So that's, that's a massive change, but I'm, I believe that's something which uh, a lot more uh, regulators are realizing that unless and until EKYC is made risk-based and not prescriptive, digital payments will not succeed. Thanks, Kanchan, for that. I think uh, shifting gears a bit away, much of the conversations we've been having today uh, seem to have an impetus or a reflection on a more mature demographic, perhaps, or a more, uh, you know, well-banked ecosystem, all right? I'd, I'd like to focus a, a bit more on an under, underbanked ecosystem 
uh, a demographic that doesn't necessarily look at digital payments and their day-to-day -day interactions. Puneet, uh, you know, from looking at the Egypt market right now, right, you, you have the groundwork for a, a population that's 100 million people, uh, 95 million are domestic, 5 million are expatriate. Um, and, you know, you have players such as Fowry, for example, that IPO'd trying to digitize, uh, you know, service offerings when it comes to uh, payments or transactions, correct? With all of this in place, uh, fine, a pat on the back, but still a long way to go, I think, in reaching out to people and giving them access to services. What are you seeing happening as initiatives from the private sector or the government sector to, to basically, you know, offer these these ability for people to have these uh, access to anything of, of, you know, payments or digitization or interactions, right? They all have phones. It might be a feature phone. It might be a smartphone. But does that change their habit? Does that change their interaction? Is the rails mature enough? Is there no, enough out there? So uh, I think that's a very good question, uh, Gaurav. So when you talk about just one of the payment method, but there are multiple other payment methods and multiple other wallets as well. So what uh, the government has started is connected all these wallets within a single ecosystem. So that initiative was a very interesting initiative. So the biggest challenge in a country with a population where 95% is uh, the local country and 80% is cash or even 90% is cash. So how do you make sure that that particular person converts online? So the government, uh, because of the initiative called as Pahvil, so what they've done is they've connected all the wallets. So whether it's a feature phone or it's a normal phone, what is important is how that particular person should not pay cash and how he should convert to a wallet. So now the only problem two years back was a person having a Favri uh, wallet and a, a, a merchant having a Favri acceptance can only pay because it was a closed loop ecosystem, right? So there are multiple closed loop ecosystems. So the interesting thing now, what people have started doing is they've connected all the closed loop ecosystems in a single switch. So now today, if you have a Favri acceptance, you can also pay using your Aman or a Masari or a CIB bank wallet, for example. So all of these is one of the connection which is done. Now, the most important thing answering one of the question and also your question is, Having acceptance is not a challenge, but what is the acceptability or how to manage that from the merchant's perspective? Now, that particular challenge is still is still trying to, you know, you know, people are still trying to get to it. But because of the government initiative of MISA, now they are actually issuing a free debit card for all the workers, a free debit card for all the people other than areas in Cairo and uh, the other popular cities. So... Whether that will help to change, I think yes. Because these cards will be issued in five minutes and they've also kept some agents to issue the cards and they don't have to go to a bank. So if you talk about 95% of a cash economy, how to convert that, obviously it's a five to 10 years uh, where you see more than 50%. But if you see that initiative from the government, yes, there is a huge push from all the regulators across in fact, Gaurav, uh, you think about Iraq as a market as well. 98% market is cash. I think we were having a conversation. So now what, what is the need is how you can connect this particular closed loop system. Like, uh, like we all discussed about the Visa MasterCard rails. How to extend your local rails to make as an international rails where all these closed loop systems are connected and how that part particular merchant can accept it and manage it can be just a small featured phone with USSD payments. So there is a lot of innovation still pending, but the main fundamental is how to simplify and how to make it as low as zero. So that is what everyone is trying to fix. Thanks, Puneet, uh, for that insight. I think, again, uh, just, to, just to wrap up the session here uh, collectively, um, what I'd like to say is it's, it's been very interesting to understand how things are moving when it comes to cash. As a summary, we can say cash is not going to become redundant. The, we can also say that the rails need to be in place to provide that. 
the cost or who's going to manage the cost of providing that from the private sector or the government sector was going to be interesting to see play out in each ecosystem as it's relevant, whether it's Asia, North America, the Middle East, Africa, India as a market. I think what we can also safely say is that looking at how things are moving, COVID being, as PK put it out there, an earthquake, right, in terms of trying to bring this topic and discussion forward, a lot of people will look at what was nice to have as something that is definitely needed today. And that itself will organically lead to the next stage. I think there is a new normal of technology. There's a new normal of the landscape of people being educated with the uses of these technology. And I think there's going to be a new normal uh, very soon when it comes to the lifestyle we're living today. And that itself is going to determine the reduction of the interaction and use of cash but not its redundancy in its entirety. So with that summation, I'd like to say thank you once again to all of our panelists. We value your expertise, your time, and your friendship. Thank you for, to Tai for putting everything together. Uh, these talks make the world go around, connect the global ecosystem, and I'm sure all of us are available to connect to people if, should they have any questions, or they need to connect to any of our panelists with regards to their expertise or their backgrounds in any way, shape, or form. And we look forward to seeing you at the next Thai Entrepreneur, the Thai Dubai sessions and talks that we're having. Thank you all very much.